Hello, thank you for joining us today for a sponsored webinar from GE Digital on It's More Than Grayscale, Busting Myths About High Performance HMI. I'm Billy Emis, I'm a sales associate here at AWWA, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Here are some tips to enhance your webinar experience. We recommend you close email, instant messengers, and any other programs not currently in use, as they may interfere with a smooth reception of the webinar, causing slide buffering and poor sound quality. Technical assistance can be found at the GoToWebinar technical support page at the link listed in your handouts and on the slide shown. As soon as you close the GoToWebinar screen to leave a webinar, a window will open with a survey questionnaire. We asked that you take a few minutes to answer the survey questions. Your feedback is important to us and helps us improve webinar programming. Before we hear from our speakers, I need to inform you that the mention of specific products or services in this webinar does not represent a WWA endorsement. A WWA does not endorse or approve products or services. I am pleased to introduce our distinguished panel of experts for today's program. Scott Duhame, a senior product manager at GE Digital, Lee McDermott, a program manager for the region of Waterloo, and Aaron Knight, the director of innovation for Gray Matter. Let's begin. Scott Duhame will start us off with a presentation on how high performance HMI is about enabling the smart operator. Take it away, Scott. Thank you, Billy. Uh, today, operators are facing a lot of uh, uh, factors <clears throat> that are providing a process complexity and regulatory compliance issues for them. And uh, the producers that they work for, they're under pressure, pressure to produce more with the same staff or less than before. You know, this, this is true, you know, whether maintaining a water treatment, distribution, collection, or wastewater system or plant. And in some cases, this pressure is, is even, it's increasing due to the COVID-19 pandemic. As we've heard some producers losing staff, positions due to these kind of budget cuts. You know, in an article that we wrote last year for AWWA and Oplo Magazine, we said that the high performance HMI was about enabling the smart operator to be the superhero of the organization. And what we mean by that is, you know, when provided with well-designed screens that highlight critical information in context and at the right time, the users make the right decisions quickly with speed, confidence, and even superhuman strength, you know, preventing or eliminating mistakes. So what makes a good operator interface? You know, there's, from an operator's perspective, there's a number of elements for the HMI designer to consider when developing screens to enable the, the smart operator. The screen has to be simple and uncluttered, immediately recognizable, and abnormal conditions need to stand out from normal operations while providing enough information for the operator to have complete confidence in the correct action to take. But, you know, but um, we, we know what you're thinking. So you said, how does that high performance HMI, how does it do all that? Because, you know, the comments that we hear quite often at the start of many projects are, you know, it's just it's it's just grayscale. It's really kind of boring. It's featureless. It, it doesn't make me a better operator, or you know, it just doesn't represent specifically my process and and what makes sense. Or you know, it's it's all cookie cutter. It's one size fits all, and that doesn't apply to me. And probably the biggest obstacle of, of all is purely inertia. You know, somebody that's been using the same screen for for decades and and they know where everything is. So let's bust a few myths. First is, it's not just about gray. It's not just grayscale. The, the standard covers a wide range of topics that simplify the interface, you know, speeding operator response time, <clears throat> improve alarm uh, resolution, problem resolution, and reducing errors and mistakes. Yes. Color and grayscale are part of the standard, but it's not exclusively about color. You know, it covers things like shape and style, typography, navigation, situation and analysis, intelligent alarming and trending, and, and there's, there's more to it at that. So, you know, while color is used to draw attention, you know, and the common colors 
are shades of gray. You know, they're considered neutral. So those are primarily used for, for backgrounds. And the eye tends to see warmer colors or shades of red first. So these are used to tell the operator about abnormal conditions. While some of the cooler colors of blue and, and green are safe for, for normal operations. But can't just use color by itself. You, you have to uh, bring in other elements and other indicators, such as text, simple objects, that, that provide the operator with the right information to make the right decision. So color alone is not all that in, uh, impactful for high performance HMI. You combine these elements with you know, simple shapes, um, common elements, because they ensure consistency in the presentation of information and reduce operator strain and effort, helping users understand and learn information faster with low effort. In our vernacular, we call these common shapes dynamos, and they are often repeated throughout the HMI screen. Color themes, for example, you know, when you, when you define your color palettes, you wanna make sure that you use appropriate color contrast to minimize distractions and visual clutter and provide focus you know, to abnormal situations. Our style guides call out specific colors for, for different environments, indoor bright or dark environments or outdoor uh, natural light environments. And what's interesting is the use the, the, the use of right colors can mean the difference between night and day. You know, lighting may be different in the control room versus being out in the field next to an asset or shift to shift. So even subtle differences in colors, you know, can mean the night difference between night and day. These two slides are actually quite interesting when you show them back and forth because it's only subtle differences um, in the color palette. And so what you want to do is you want to keep in mind the environments that you're designing for, although the information is exactly the same, you know, slight changes to the color palette, they bring dramatic changes to the HMI. Another is that the real world can be very hard to navigate. So, you know, for those wanting a real world HMI screen, it's uh, sometimes easier to present the data in a more standard function. The uh, other aspects that you want to think about is keeping it simple. When you eliminate noise uh, by using basic repeatable shapes, a basic color palette that highlights abnormal situations, and HMI, the HMI operators, they spend less time searching and navigating, and they can make decisions faster. Keeping it simple also makes it easier to train the next generation of operator. So and the, another thing is people say, hey, I know where everything is. But, you know, if you look at the person on the, on the left and the person on the right, you probably know who spends less time searching for the right tool at the right time. So similar to decluttering an office, for example, high performance HMI provides a methodology in decluttering the HMI to make the operator more efficient and less prone to error. So is really what we're looking for is something that uh, provides less, you know, it requires less training, it reacts, the, the reaction time is faster, it leads to safer operation, and obviously increasing you know, productivity and reducing time. So a good interface is easy to learn and, and, and makes the operator higher productive. High performance HMI, however, can mean a change to your operation. <clears throat> and we all know change is hard, especially if you've been using the same screens for a long time. But the high performance HMI methods, they've been around for, for quite a while, more than a decade, for is it? And they are, they are proven to be successful. So if this is something that you are considering, there are definitely ways to do it right. And to help with buy-in, we recommend making sure that you get your users involved in the process early. Later in the presentation, Aaron Knight will be providing some best practices. But now what I'd like to do is I'd like to actually turn the uh, presentation over to Lee McDermott, who's gonna talk us through the journey that the region of Waterloo has been on to implement high performance HMI. Lee? All right, uh, thank you very much, Scott. I think, uh, I think what you'll be seeing in, uh, in our presentation is uh, many of the same 
uh, concepts that Scott's just talked about. And in fact, uh, uh, you'll see some uh, elements and different graphics that are very, you know, very similar to what uh, Scott just showed. So uh, what I'm going to do today is just walk you through our deployment of high performance at the uh, the region of Waterloo, and it uh, is basically encapsulating all of our water system. So we haven't, uh, this project does not get into the wastewater side, uh, but uh, they, uh, the wastewater group is looking at the uh, high performance as a, as a go-to as well. And uh, I'll walk you through a little bit of background, what we needed to do, some of the decisions that uh, we, we needed to make early on, and then I'll have a, a pretty big section on the screen fundamentals. What do our screens actually look like? Uh, what did we incorporate into our design? Uh, I'll, I'll finish up with some uh, development and deployment, uh, essentially processes that uh, we use to, to roll out. And then the, uh, the final slides are lessons learned. And uh, in terms of background, we're, we're located about an an hour west of Toronto by highway and about two hours east of Detroit, Michigan. So if you find us on a map, City of Waterloo, City of Kitchener, City of Cambridge, and we run a couple of different ways in, in our geography. We have a two tier system and a one tier system for two of the smaller municipalities. And uh, for the two tier municipalities, we deliver wholesale water to them and they have uh, distribution, local distribution systems and uh, deal with the residents and uh, users. Uh, for the one tier, we are sourced to tap. Now, our uh, our screen redevelopment project actually started uh, under the umbrella of a uh, an upgrade program for a bunch of controllers. So these are the actual PLCs that run all of our facilities, and uh, the screen redevelopment is just part of that. And in terms of the technical challenges of the program, we uh, we have. Five major ones. I'm really only going to be talking about the SCADA screens and some alarming today, but uh, we had uh, original PLC hardware was uh, SCADA pack from Schneider Electric. Unfortunately, that product's been discontinued, so we needed to move off of that. Uh, we had been using uh, 5.5 uh, iFix, or we currently still use some iFix 5.5 screens in a multi color format, and uh, product support ended in 2019 for that, and we've got a redevelop and, and redeploy some new screens. For uh, standards, we had two separate standards for water and wastewater. So we wanted to bring those together for some organizational efficiency. In terms of the IT side, we had uh, four separate physical clusters uh, of servers and uh, we wanted to bring together the IT infrastructure for both water and wastewater and uh, try to get more out of, uh, out of that system. And in terms of alarming, we Never done an alarm prioritization process prior to this program, and uh, we have lots of nuisance alarms, uh, and those uh, we're starting to get rid of those with this program. In terms of the planning and and what we've been doing for the last couple of years, it all started with a program charter, and that was uh, essentially the roadmap to the start and to get to the finish line. Uh, we started off with some of the IT work, uh, and then uh, in parallel, the standards development uh, as under the standards development umbrella, we also tackled the alarm standards. And, and those are all done now, along with the IT deployment. The, uh, the screen work started shortly, shortly after the beginning of 2018 has, and has been going on uh, since that time. And uh, the last, last piece, the more recent 2019, was the program work. And this is that hardware changeout. And why I have that on here is just to show that there is some interactivity now between uh, the, the screen work and the, the new program because we're changing our standards and we have a new alarm handling that we need to, uh, to work with and uh, some new alarm fragments that you'll see later on how they interact with the screens or how they uh, allow the screens to be more powerful. And organizational challenges, uh, Scott, made reference to this. Uh, you need to make sure that everybody's on board and you need to have that uh, that vision. And that's something that we did with that charter. And uh, we have a bunch of different parts of the program. And that, uh, that charter was useful along with uh, many other workshops and uh, just that communication. Where are we going? In terms of decisions, what we actually decided to do as part of this program, 
Uh, we've standardized on Allen Bradley. That's the same as what we use in our uh, wastewater facilities. Uh, at the time in 2018, we made the decision to go with the iFix 5.9 in the high performance uh, in a high performance design, and, uh, and that was consistent with our uh, our staff knowledge of the the system. So it was a easy decision for us. In terms of standards, we have combined both water and wastewater, and uh, for the IT side, we now have uh, two clusters using hyper-converged uh, server architectures, and, and that's uh, those are working pretty well. We've got to do some network changes still to, to flatten it out and uh, allow us to connect both water and wastewater, but uh, all is on track. And then the, uh, the alarming, we have deployed an alarm management standard, and that's uh, given us a lot of power in terms of the, the alarm uh, categorization and uh, eliminating nuisance alarms. So why the rationale for high performance? Well, there was an opportunity. We had to redevelop all the screens uh, basically natively. Uh, we couldn't just do a conversion from 5.5. And, uh, and obviously for the new program uh, version 5.9, there was uh, many other features and benefits to that. So uh, it made sense to do that from a performance perspective, much like Scott was talking about, is how do you better enunciate the most critical issues that you're facing in your system? So how can you find them faster? How can you respond to them faster? And then a big one was succession planning. We've got a lot of turnover in the next few years. And uh, how, do you, how do you reduce the training requirement for new operators? And how do you make things very consistent so that the learning experience and also the using user experience is, is, uh, is more straightforward? And in terms of the, the actual space screens, I'm now spending a bunch of the slides. You're going to see all of the features of our new New, new screen design. And this is our 5.5 standard. Uh, very colorful. You know, you've got uh, all, we call them Christmas tree screens because they, they do have such a, a color palette. And this is our new screen. Uh, as Scott said, this is boring grayscale. But uh, very nice thing about the boring grayscale is that this, this particular facility is showing that everything is in normal uh, operating conditions. And uh, if you're an operator, you take one quick glance at this, you don't see any color, you can move on. You know that uh, everything's working well. It all started with the standards, as I mentioned, the ISA 101, and uh, Scott already talked about this. You've got different different aspects of this standard, graphics and color elements uh, that you're using, the dynamos, uh, screen hierarchy, really understanding okay, what is the hierarchy of all of these systems. For us, it was the rural and urban systems and the process inside very complicated plants. Uh, the navigation between screens and moving around. And uh, the final piece, which is also you know, one of the most important ones, is alarming and some security. And uh, this screen is, I'm gonna walk you through what these screens uh, really involve. Uh, you've got a, a top title bar, and in that title bar, you've got a, a stack on the left-hand side this is our navigation stack up here that allows you brings down a, a menu. Uh, you've got this uh, dark mode, light mode toggle switch. So we actually have built in feature functionality to, uh, to change the, uh, the color of the, the gray goes darker or lighter depending on uh, that toggle. Uh, we also have some buttons for our uh, right here, the buttons for the, uh, the dashboards which give you the oversight, the birds, more of a bird's eye view of each area. Uh, then we have some uh, compliance buttons here. This is uh, to access compliance information. And then we've got an alarm uh, summary area. In the, uh, in the center of the screen, you see the uh, process pane. And this is reserved for all of the process equipment. So in this case, this is an operating plant, and uh, you can see there's wells and uh, filters, reservoirs, boosters, and a uh, tank out in the tank out in the community. On the right hand side, you have a control pane, and this is the area where you can access all of the set points. Uh, in this case, wells, boosters. But you also have building information, so you can see we actually have a, a, an alarm for a building flood right now. And uh, I believe this is a faulty, uh, faulty float switch. But uh, in that, in the screen, that's the only color that's lit up at the moment. Everything else is normally operating. 
But on the bottom left, we have a compliance pane. And this is where we've, we've aggregated all of that compliance data, CT calculations, the actual trend, uh, chlorine pump resets, uh, different uh, well booster resets. Uh, we also have alarm and uh, filter set alarm set points and, and other flow information that's critical. And the last pane is this KPI trend pane. In here, we've put in three key performance indicators that uh, gives you a quick window into those uh, that data. And uh, you can pinch and zoom that, that trend area. It allows you to see if you, you can see there's white, there's gray and, and black. And it just gives you a 12 hour window to, so you don't have to access your trend, your separate trend screen. So it's just a, a nice feature just to quickly review. And we know that some operators do use that. Uh, not everybody uses it, but uh, definitely a great feature. Now in terms of colors, well, you can see not much in the way of color on the screen. We have everything, it's all shades of gray. But uh, when you see shades of gray, again, it's me, it means that it's all in operating normal conditions. In terms of devices, you can see some wells on the upper left. In the middle, there's some valves. And on the, uh, the right bottom, you can see some pumps. And anything in white is operating. Anything in charcoal or dark gray is off. And uh, you can see a valve right in the center of this, uh, in the center of the filter screen. This valve is, uh, is actually throttled. So it's off. It's not off. It's not, well, it's not closed and it's not open, but it's uh, throttled. And then, uh, Tanks, uh, the reservoirs that we have on site, these are low grade reservoirs. Uh, these are particularly interesting dynamos from a design perspective because on the, uh, on the right, you see that we have a, uh, a linear gauge. And this linear gauge, you'll see different stacks. And those are your alarm set points. So the white, the white zone or the very, it's very light blue actually, just to make it pop a bit more. This is your normal operating range for that reservoir. and uh, the band below is your, your low high, and then you've got your low low, similarly on the high. And this is a 12, uh, 12 hour trend for that tank. So a bit of a benefit if you're quickly scanning this, you can see what is that trend doing? You should be seeing those, those diurnal patterns through the, through the day. So if you see something different, you immediately can see, hey, there's something going on trend wise with that tank. And then here's the instruments. They're pretty, pretty benign, but uh, R is residual, T is turbidity, F is flow, P is pressure. So pretty standard. And these will have different colors associated with them when they're in alarm state. And this is actually just a, a quick overview of, of some of those uh, when they're in a non-normal state. So you can see over on the top left here, you've got the fail and not available for pumps. Uh, similarly, for dosing pumps, you get uh, fail is blue again. Uh, some of these instruments, they light up with the color of the, uh, of the alarm state. So this is a low, low, obviously. We've got zero for pressure, for tank, and residual. Uh, the residual actually blinks, so it even has a greater enunciation, say that we have a problem. And then filter is just an example here where you have different levels associated with filter operation. Hierarchy is uh, something that uh, we spent a lot of time on to uh, to get it right and to really make it make it sensible to the operators using it. And we have again that rural side, and we have a urban side, and we've got overall we've got four dashboards, and then we've got some compliance dashboards which provide information on the entire system, and then an overall dashboard as well. And what I'm going to do in the next few slides is just walk you through some of that uh, hierarchy of what kind of information is in each one. This is our overview dashboard. And uh, we've actually overlaid system information onto a map. And uh, these aren't live yet. These are still in development. But uh, the idea here is that you can quickly get, in, get some insight into uh, status all throughout our geography. And uh, first step, or the Directly below these are these compliance dashboards. And this is actually a Mark I uh, residual dashboard. We, we actually did not go forward with this. Uh, we, we found got some feedback that it was a little bit too uh, complicated. And uh, we simply have numbers now. And then when the numbers are uh, 
or when that residual is is in an alarm band and actually lights up with the uh, uh, with the alarm state. But uh, just gives you a, an idea of the powerful options available uh, for different graphic elements and different dynamos. Going back to that overview again, if we want to go into our rural, what we did for the rural was uh, we put all of the rural systems onto one dashboard. So we can get, a again, a bird's eye view of all of the key performance indicators for all of our rural and they're all consistent. So you can see we have a spark line for, uh, for reservoirs if we have them. We have a residual linear gauge. We have a flow horizontal linear gauge. And we have a, a speedo, which is the pressure. And you can see for each of these, they have the bands, so you can tell where it is in context. And and that 12-hour, you have know, that 12-hour trend of the tank. And uh, again, it's all very consistent. Where we don't have tanks, you don't see any, you don't see those elements. And then from this, we can drop down into our sites, our, our site screens and uh, and again we've, we've seen this screen previously going back we can now go into a city dashboard city dashboard is a little bit different because we're what we're doing here is depicting pressure zones in that dashboard along with all of the equipment so you can see here we have uh, multiple zones in our uh, in our kitchener uh, city geography and uh, this shows all the interconnections between uh, those zones uh, boundary boundary valves and all the facilities that live inside a particular zone and pump to that zone. And, and again, very similar to uh, what we did with the rural, we're using linear gauges for, uh, for, for flow, we're using speedos for pressure and residual, all very consistent. And then from here, we can also go down into a facility dashboard. This is one of our, this is our large surface water treatment plant. And each of these, darker gray rectangles are a process area within that plant. And uh, you can see that it's, it's comprised of dashboard represents the, uh, the various process areas. And from here, you can actually go into, uh, directly go into pop-ups and trends uh, from that dashboard and also from within the process screen. So these are just, uh, some examples of, of a well pop-up. And you can see for the trend screens, we have utilized color because it's uh, very difficult to depict that many different sources of information in a, in a grayscale. So we do have color being used in our trends. Now, in terms of navigation, we've done, we've allowed or we've built in the navigation design in a few different ways. So we have these dashboards, so we can directly go to a city dashboard then to a facility, then to pop-ups, then to uh, set point pop-ups. But we can also use our, uh, our stack and go directly to a particular facility. And the other thing that we've done with the dashboard is to allow pop-up access directly from the, the dashboard. And this is, this is something that we built in, uh, in consultation with our operating staff, because they, if they're sitting on a dashboard, they may need to allow a lab or a sampling tech into a facility and you know turn off building security or turn off a pump, turn off a well. And this was a, a nice feature just to allow them to be a little bit more efficient than having to jump through screens. One of the big uh, design aspects that we tackled at the beginning was the aspect ratio. We select the 16-9 ratio just to uh, uh, basically make it all consistent. There's another way you could do this. You could do scaling of, of these screens, but uh, the development for the scaling is, is a bit of a burden. And uh, so we, we did need to buy new laptops and monitors for some staff to, to get them that, that larger resolution, but uh, significantly lower cost when you consider the development. And then the last real important part of our screen design was the uh, alarm, the alarm sorting uh, and the alarm uh, basically enunciation. We, through our alarm prioritization process, we captured a bunch of different tags or a bunch of different fragments so that we could sort. And you can see this little sorting tool up at the top of the alarm bar. 
uh, we can sort based on area and site, our pressure zone, different processes, the criticality of the alarm, uh, the compliance, if it's compliance related, and also asset management. The power of this is not only going through a whole pile of alarms that may be up on your alarm page, but it's also analytics after the fact. So you may want to do some analytics to figure out why are we getting particular alarms at a facility or in a, you know, in a pressure zone. So that's, uh, that's particularly powerful. And, and this uh, sorting tool was uh, spent a lot of time on uh, trying to figure that out and do it right. And in terms of the development process, what we started with was uh, wireframe screens. So we basically laid out some screens. Uh, we then met with, uh, with staff to review and gain acceptance of those wireframes. Uh, only then did we get into the detailed production development. Uh, and then we had two steps of QAQC. We had a, basically gray matter helped us with the development QAQC, and then we took over the uh, uh, the region side QAQC and then once we've identified deficiencies those were any issues were dealt with and then we were ready for deployment and uh, sorry about that so in terms of the development or the deployment process itself we we have now screens that have been uh, QAQC tested we're ready for testing and we've updated our databases. So this is the IFEX 5.9 server. All the tags are in there and we've verified. Uh, we can now do the software acceptance testing or the site acceptance testing. Uh, after that testing, they're essentially ready to go live, but we want, we've done, uh, depending on the screen, we've done different training and, and workshops uh, to, to make sure the operators are, know exactly uh, what the screens are all about. Uh, for some of our more complex uh, rollouts, we're considering an overlap period as well for both, both the 5.5 and the 5.9 screens being live at the same time. And that's just a you know a check for operators; they can go back and forth and and learn a bit more on the on the go or on that in the heat of the moment. And then the other thing that we've really uh, struggled with or not struggled with uh, necessarily but we've learned is that we have what's what i call an extended acceptance testing period and that's where you have operators sitting in front of a screen and they find they find certain certain issues and uh, we've we've worked hard to uh you know come up with solutions and uh, modify the style guide to address those and uh, and for these, um, just an as an example, one of our compliance screens is a uh, is a reservoir level or tank level, and we uh, we did a lot of work on uh, fonts and sizes and uh, and and some of the designs to accommodate because it was uh, on these large screens it was it was difficult to to see uh, some of the fonts that we had selected. And then once all that's done, we have a fully live system. And we'll go back and we'll do a, a style guide update. And that will be our new going forward style uh, into the future or standard essentially. And in terms of the preliminary results of what we've, what we've seen out of our deployment to date, there has been very good acceptance of new elements, uh, the layouts and alarm states. Uh, we have uh, you know positive comments on, on a lot of that. And one of the things that it's been really interesting is that we've had a, a, a great acceptance and pushback on uh, on that high performance. So we had some screens, let's say the Mark One or Mark Two screens, that had a bit of color on them, and those have been excised out. Uh, staff have said, "Hey, why do we have color? Get rid of it." And uh, so that's been really interesting. And there has been feedback that they are easier to learn and they're easier to understand because they're very consistent in their uh, in, in the design and their layout. And in terms of lessons learned from an organizational perspective, the uh, the one thing that that we we uh, we had done early on was this project charter, and that's something that uh, is valuable. Uh, think about doing a charter to to get all of your stakeholders in alignment, and uh, and then have a plan to reinforce that uh, roadmap. Uh, 
Other big ones, standards are critical. Uh, you really should be driving to decisions where you can because any gaps along the way, they're going to cost dollars and they're going to extend the, uh, the schedule. And mainly because if you find problems, you're going to have to go back and redevelop, be redeveloping screens that are already deployed. Otherwise, they're going to be very different than the, say, the generation of screens that you rolled out at the very end. And, you know, big one that uh, we've been working around is the organiza organizational impacts of the project work. So knowing what the resources are and if you have a problem, what's your fallback plan? So just addressing, uh, we had some people move on from our group, uh, went to a different part of the region. And uh, so that's been, there's been some growing pains with some staffing. And in terms of screen development, uh, on the right, you can see Mark, that was Mark 1 of the one screen, and that's the, the final version of the, the same screen, uh, slightly different uh, colors. But what is really helpful is to have uh, an early style guide or a preliminary style guide and really discuss that with all the stakeholders. Try to nail that down as, as tight as possible. You can definitely see that there's many elements that are the same, but there are a few elements that have changed. Uh, namely, the uh, you can see the, the wells. We had we had used uh, similar style to the reservoirs for the wells, but uh, there wasn't any value in that. So we went back to the old version of, of the of the well icon. All right. The other benefit uh, beneficial way to roll these out is to beta test. So take a representative screen and, and beta test that. Get, in, get that in front of operators, let them actually use it. Because seeing everything in, in a fixed or a, a, not a static state is one thing, but actually seeing it in a dynamic state and actually operating it is very different. And, in, and obviously, as part of that, you incrementally roll out if you can. Uh, that allows you to uh, gain that insight into the first screens and incorporate that and revise your style guide. And then the big one is uh, QA, QC and documentation. Can't be overdone ever because the more documentation you have and uh, uh, understanding of what, you're, what you did yesterday helps you with tomorrow. And that's, uh, that's it. I'm gonna hand this over to Aaron. Thank you, Lee. Um, I've got the easy role here. It's uh, This is going to be some review of what you've seen today, but my goal here is to give you guys some practical uh, advice on where you can get started. And um, and then, you know, where, where you can start and get some, find some low-hanging fruit. Uh, so you saw this on both Scott's and... Uh, Lee's slides, but you cannot um, underestimate how big a project this can be. So it does require some planning, and and you can see I've, I'm showing an actual drawing of some pre-planning phases by our engineer on this project, um, done with crayons. But it is a it is a very large undertaking if you want it to be, but if you don't have a project plan, your scope can get out of hand very quickly. Um, there can be a lot of moving elements to high-performance HMI, which can include complete system overhauls, uh, as well as redesigns of your architecture, so relicensing and, and re-equipping of your equipment. Um, sorry, I'm having a little bit of delay on my slides here. Get your stakeholders and partners involved, um, especially as you start to see the scope of what this undertaking could be for you in your environment, you'll want to make sure that you've got your operators involved and your directors involved, but also any external partners that will be working in your system during the time of this project. Um, every, everyone's going to have an opinion on which direction to go, but having them involved early on makes sure that they can identify any pitfalls that they see on the parts of the work that they're doing. Uh, workshop, workshop, and workshop. Um, this all goes to the pre-planning phases again. We have so many um, large groups together on the Region of Waterloo project, and thank goodness we have. 
we've gotten extremely valuable feedback from every level of uh, employee at the region. And all of that feedback um, has been incorporated into the way that we've designed the screens with them and for them. Um, and every time you review, you're, you're giving yourself one more opportunity before you go and put all the work to putting a system live and then finding out that it's not to your, to your needs. Um, linked to that is document and share. Lee mentioned, of course, that we've created an HMI style guide for uh, their high performance graphics so that anyone working with their system will know how to create the dynamos and how to use them. But to keep it updated, and to make sure you share it widely within the organization. Um, we are on several revs of this as, as the project has evolved because us, the way that you identify an object on the screen may change over time as people find that they either add value or they don't add value. And so like Lee's last slide was showing you, some elements may be removed because they're not showing or adding value. And in that regard, we've taken this out of the standards documents and called it very intentionally an HMI style guide as an appendix to the standards for the region of Waterloo, which allows us to keep this as more of a living document that does not necessarily set in stone and can evolve over time. And lastly, and very importantly, um, high performance graphics are really good at pointing out your failures to identify nuisance alarms um, before you start the project. Uh, as you flatten the colors of your screens, all alarms, whether they're just low alarms, low, low alarms, you know, what, whatever the severity, or even just notifications, really start to highlight on every screen. And those often roll up to a dashboard level. And so on a dashboard level, you can end up with just a red dashboard all the time. Um, taking the time to carefully consider your alarm uh, strategies is a really important step, I think, in, in undertaking this large project. Um, now, those things combined actually sound like a pretty big undertaking, but it doesn't have to be. Some of the, and sorry, I'm having a slide delay again, but you guys are probably up to speed. I want to talk maybe a little bit about some of the low hanging fruit that you can relatively easily integrate into your existing screens without undertaking the whole project. So replacing data links with gauges. Lee talked about some of the uses of gauges in his application, but in this case, you can see from going from just a, a raw water level, um, we're now identifying the fill percentage. We're identifying where the alarm set points are. And um, and, and so you're taking one data point and turning it into six or seven data points with context. Um, using embedded trend objects and spark lines. You saw some of these in Lee's dashboard and I've blown a couple of them up here. But this is one of the tools that allows you to very quickly identify if you need to change the set points for some of your alarms. Specifically, if your operator can see 12 hours of history on a well level or on a, a reservoir level, they don't necessarily need the alarms to pre-alarm. They can see if they're trending in or out of alarm so they don't have to navigate to other screens to see those, uh, those trend lines. Um, one of the very obvious ones, and I know a lot of you still have this in there, but it's, it's um, something we used to do quite a bit, but all of the colorful and 3D piping that we've shown over the years um, is important for people to have noted from a maintenance perspective, but is not necessarily that important for the good functioning of an HMI SCADA system. So flattening those pipes down to directional arrows and, um, and then showing the flow direction is sufficient to show people the structure of your system without overdoing it with color. Uh, this is one of GE's classic sample system uh, pictures from 20 years ago that you might be familiar with, but it's got all of the things we're trying to eliminate these days. Um, we've got gradients galore. This is this entire picture actually only represents about 10 data points. Um, so in, in taking this entire screen down to even just a spark line, you've got way more data in these two elements than you do in the entire screen below. Um, and then using things that 
you know, may look more like a smartphone in some sense, but it's intuitive to the user on how to use this navigation stack to pop down. Um, it's also fairly easy for someone to look at this and know that they're in a high light or a, a, a well lit or in a sunlit application or area. They can change the view very quickly so that they can see more clearly what they're doing. Um, even if you don't change or modify your background colors today, if you're using a white background, it has uh, less contrast than a lot of other colors. But especially if you're using a gradient background or no background, pre-selecting the grayscales that allow you to use more colors without, um, without having too, uh, too many colors on your screen. And starting to choose the colors that will work best with your background color, even if you don't implement them across the entire screen today. Which leads to encapsulating process areas. So if you have a standard, but only for certain parts of your plant, and you, you can't go and affect all of your screens right away, you can come in and encapsulate certain areas so that you understand what processes are held within one card. Uh, so, you know, here we have an example of the filters all in one card and then the reservoirs, each reservoir in its own card. And here below, we have an entire site in its own card to identify uh, one entire plant using a very small set of uh, graphics. And one of the easy ones to overlook, but it really is a, a fairly easy thing to do, but it, it does take some time to look at. Um, Use it, having consistency throughout your system before you undertake a major change, because a lot of these systems have been built up by many people and over a lot of years. We have inconsistent uh, tag names. Um, some are all in caps, some are in lowercase. They're not always following the name, naming tag conventions. Um, your units on your screens, but also in your database, are often inconsistent over time, as people have learned uh, learned the short versions or the long versions or whether there was a period behind minutes or not. And of course, going back through your screens and having consistency on font sizes uh, and types, as well as line thicknesses and pipe thicknesses and things like that. Those are some of the easy places to start without kicking off an entire new project. Um, from my standpoint, that's, that's where we sit. Um, you can follow Gray Matter on Tech Hub, and the link is up on the page in GE at GE's blog. And I'd like to thank you all for your time today, and I'll hand it back to Billy. Okay, thank you so much, Aaron. Um, I wanted to say thank you very much to Scott, Aaron, and Lee for your expertise on implementing a high-performance HMI and how that can simplify the operator interface, allowing for faster and more accurate decision-making on priority issues in the plant. We'll now transition to the question and answer part of this session. Uh, please submit your questions using the questions pane at any time during the broadcast. And we'll go ahead and get started with our first question. Our first question is actually from Kevin. Kevin would like to know, when an alarm becomes active, how do you find where it is? Assume you are not one screen and the alarm is on another screen. Assume, pardon me, assuming you are on one screen and the alarm is on the other screen. <laughs> do you want me to handle that, uh, Aaron? And yeah, I think, this is, I think this is specific to your application, Lee. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So we have, uh, when there's a, an alarm, uh, the, we have a button on our title bar that allows, takes you right to uh, an alarm screen. And uh, uh, from there, you can uh, you basically just call that up. So you can find out immediately. And what we've done with our, uh, with our fragments, uh, our alarms are very descriptive. So our, uh, our staff will know inherently and I, I'm trying to remember, but I think if you, uh, I don't think if you double click on the alarm, it takes you to the screen. Oh, that would be, that would be actually really cool now that I think about it. Uh, but um, by, by virtue of that tagging, you know, you know what the issue is. And with the navigation that we have, you're going to be able to navigate to that screen very quickly. So. I think it's also worth noting that, um, that we're not getting rid of alarm summaries at this point in the region of Waterloo or, or necessarily even advocating for it. Uh, the control room at the region of Waterloo has still got six or eight monitors up in it, actually 10 if you count the compliance. So there is, there is still an alarm 
um, summary page that is open there at the region. But the idea is to reduce the reliance on it. One of the other things to do is when, when the operators are at rest, we're hoping to have them, or at least some of their screens, up at the dashboard level. And the alarms do funnel up to the dashboard level, no problem. So uh, an operator in a PNID screen at the plant, it wouldn't be covering all of their screens. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Well, we actually have another question for Lee, and this one is from Nicole. Nicole asks, what was the feedback on the light and dark mode switch? Yeah, great uh, great question. So the light and dark mode, uh, we worked great matter uh, on, uh, on the light and the dark mode. And how that originally started was uh, we had some feedback about the mark one screens and we had some lighting concerns the way that the operators wanted to use them at nighttime uh, so ultimately what we ended up doing was uh, creating uh, four different versions of screens and we had everybody vote on uh, which screen they liked the best and which screen they liked the, the second best and uh, we actually had a tie between kind of a light and a dark layout so we decided let's uh let's implement this light and dark mode and uh it it was done in such a way gray matter did a great job to minimize the uh minimize that uh, development work uh, to make you know make the solution pretty pretty slick so it it worked out pretty well but it was really driven by our our all of our operators our SCADA desk operators and uh, everybody else interfacing the screens Excellent. Here's a question from Anthony that I'll put out to you, gentlemen. Um, Anthony would like to know, how difficult is it to switch from a different HMI slash SCADA system to the system that is presented today? I guess I'll jump on that one. This is Aaron. Um, it, it, it depends largely on the size of an application uh, as well as the complexity of the application, but in general, um, I, I think going to high performance requires a lot of people to rethink their HMI, regardless of whether they're switching platforms or not. So uh, I, I don't think it's much more work because there is some recreation involved, uh, whether you redo something in your existing HMI or you do it here in, uh, in GE's H HMI program. Yeah, and I just add to that, Aaron, I, I think uh, Lee here, the uh, one thing they really need to think about is your own organization. So what is the, you know, is there a general acceptance of change? And uh, it may be worthwhile for you to consider just have a, have a workshop or a expo exploratory workshop with your staff to say, hey, who's, uh, what, what does everybody think about this? And uh, it's almost like a barometer of what, uh, what you might be able to do or what you might not be able to do might also give you some good feedback on on how that process how you might need to think about rolling something out or, or actually starting the project uh, to begin with so well that's a great um that's a great transformation because um what i see is matthew actually has a question for you lee um on that he says lee mentioned that there was a general acceptance of the new high performance hmi um how did they deal with the operators that have been with the utility for 30 plus years and their desires to have a very uh, realistic looking screen or the new millennial operators that want a very flashy type screen yeah that's actually that's a great question and that's something that we uh you know we have dealt with throughout our project is that we have uh, we do have operators that are closer to retirement and you know they don't want to see change they they really you know they like the screens that they're operating and they don't want to learn something new and we have uh, a newer generation who you know they want to uh, we ultimately have a look and feel that's you know closer to let's say new you know new website development and uh, new uh, GUIs uh, graphical user interface kind of elements and features and you know that's they like that, but um, you know, ultimately, it's uh, it's going through getting that feedback, and uh, we did get feedback from, or we tried to 
incorporate feedback from everybody and everybody had different likes and dislikes and and we've we've tried to be very uh very even in our application of uh, of fixes and and take everybody's input uh to heart to to make it better so it's been a you know i think the the uh Operators closer to retirement, they they probably struggled with it more in general. But uh, I think overall, I had one operator come up to me and said, "Hey, you know what? We'll uh, we'll start using it," and uh, and that was good to hear. So there was recognition that hey, we're we're doing this project and uh, uh, and wait for the response. So. Okay, excellent. And Lee, um, here's another question I believe would be for you. This is from Duncan. Um, Duncan wants to know, did you change alarm prioritization? Also, did you add symbols representing alarms on screens, i.e. red triangle for critical alarm appears on the screen? Yeah, that's a, uh, we did add prioritization so i didn't talk about it in the presentation but we we have uh changed our alarm prioritization and now we have uh we'll actually be rolling out a new color magenta for uh and that's a critical alarm uh, so we have essentially essentially information uh, we have uh, a medium or low medium uh, major and then critical uh, alarm priorities and we've only ever had prior to that the you know, low, high, and well, we had high, 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 low, uh, so forth. But uh, that's that's changed for us. And we originally did look at putting symbol symbology around that, and that's something that was designed out early on. So people just wanted to see more enunciation, like blinking was uh, was okay, and and maybe some colors. But uh, the symbology, uh, we we didn't ultimately adopt that, and that was. You know, through the again, uh, just working with all of the staff to, to find out what everybody wanted. I'm not to say that it wouldn't work for some organizations, but we didn't ultimately adopt it. And I think just to to add in there, I think uh, high performance graphics, and, and we have been relatively careful to use high performance and not use ISA 101 because it is a it's a great guide to follow but it's not gonna be a one size fits all for every organization. Um, so I think, I think it is important to look internally to the organization to see which elements of ISA 101, but also ISA 18.2 among others that are gonna be important for you to have a high performance HMI. So I think, I think there's a lot of discussion to be had uh, for every customer and it will be individual. Um, we haven't found two high performance customers that are the same yet. Great. Well, and that also leads me to a question that Kevin has actually presented. Kevin wants to know, why did you redevelop the screens? 5.5 converts to 5.9. What was the challenge? Uh, I'll take that one quickly. Um, the, there was a little bit more to the challenge in that iFix 5.5 was the last version of iFix to support fixed desktop. And so the region of Waterloo was still using screens in the fixed desktop world. And if you're an iFix user, I think that's all I need to say. But but the graphics were at a dead end, in short. Okay. <laughs> I, might, I, might, I might add to that too, Aaron. Um, you know, the, uh, and we hear this all uh, quite a lot because, you know, for customers may be running a, an early version of the software, but uh, when, they, when, they, when they think about transforming their organization, you know, to become a high performance HMI system, probably the older screens aren't embracing that standard, right? So just upgrading from one system and copying pictures from an older system to a newer system, that just doesn't mean you're embracing the standard. So you can take that opportunity, and that could be a good opportunity to uh, to rethink how you want to uh, uh, provide a high-performance HMI system to your operator. Okay, great. I think we have time for one last question before we wrap up. Mark would like to know, what are some of the fonts that should be used for the best readability in the application? <laughs> I, I have to admit, you've got me stumped on that one. I don't know if the other two, if there's a, if there's a standard list, but um, I'd have to get back to you on that one. 
I well, I yeah. speak, we we ultimately went with very very simple fonts. Uh, and one of the interesting stories about our uh, alarm screen is that we we were using something like a Times New Roman or a, a, it, it was a, a scalable font, and uh, we ultimately changed to or we started out with a change to uh, more of a well, also a scalable, but a simple font, and it was very hard to read. And only when we went back to the same font on our alarm screen did we uh, uh, did we see that it actually was easier to read. So that was interesting. I think uh, to me it would be uh, that may be a, an exercise to really do some testing to say put up some different fonts and say what is easier to read uh, try some different fonts on different devices and uh, on the same page and then get you know get staff to uh, uh, to assess it and say what's you know what's easier to see what's easier to read perfect well thank you so very much Scott Lee and Aaron and that does complete conclude the question and answer part of our webinar today um, but before we go, I want to thank you for joining the webinar today, and please don't forget to participate in the survey immediately following the webinar. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you.